The Gravekeeper Archetype Long ago, there was an ancient Egyptian family known as the Ishtars. They were entrusted with the duty of protecting the tomb of the nameless pharaoh, along with imparting the seal of memories to him should he ever reincarnate. To ensure no information would be lost over time, the method of preserving the pharaoh's memories was unfortunately to carve the information onto the backs of the eldest male heirs of the tombkeeper lineage. And for 3,000 years, this duty would endure. That is, until the modern day, when the most recent generation of Ishtars became unable to conceive a child. With the threat of their lineage and duty ending with themselves, they decided to adopt a young boy named Odeon as their son. They trained him in the ways of the Tomb Keeper, with the goal to pass the duty on to him someday. However, to the shock of the Ishtars, some years later, they would conceive a child of their own, a girl named Ishizu. And a few years later, a male heir was born. He was known as Marik Ishtar. Tragically, the mother would die after the birth of her son. However, now as the true male heir, Marik took Odeon's place as Tomb Keeper. Despite not wanting the responsibility, against his will, the seal of memories was carved into his back, and his life of solitude, with no contact with the outside world, would begin. Odeon, though a kind and ideal son, would be treated cruelly by Marek's father, since his usefulness was no longer necessary. After years of emotional and physical torture, Marek, well, he eventually snapped and developed a split personality that would help him deal with the horrors of his life. This alternate personality would eventually murder their father and escape from the tomb fulfilling Marek's wish of being free. However, with his freedom, this dark Marek acquired a new goal, which was to find the newly reincarnated nameless pharaoh and kill him for the 3,000 years of suffering he had unbeknowingly caused his family. Fast forward to the end of the series, however, and Yami Marek is defeated by the nameless pharaoh. Marek reconciles with the nameless pharaoh, and both he and Ashizu impart their wisdom to him. With the pharaoh reincarnated, the knowledge imparted to him, this would end the duty of the Tomb Keepers for all time. The Gravekeeper archetype is an all spellcaster, all dark series of monsters that in theory could each individually be members from the 3000 year lineage of the Ishtar Tomb Keeper family. As we'll talk a little bit later about it, but there are some characters that are direct references. And even outside of the Ishtar family, there's some notable characters. One of which is Shardi, who in the manga was also a Tomb Keeper. However, he would eventually split away from the traditional duties of the Tomb Keeper, but regardless, he would get his own card called Millennium Seeker. The Great Keeper archetype first released in the 2003 pack, Pharaonic Guardian. Inside this pack were several Great Keeper monsters as well as the field spell Necrovalley, which supported them. The significance of this is that, well, the Gravekeepers, they're one of the first ever archetypes to be established in the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game. Kind of fitting when you think about the lore, since the Tomb Keepers were around since the birth of the card game. So we know what they are. But the question then becomes, what can this archetype do? Well, a Gravekeeper deck is all about sitting off the graveyard. You see, this deck revolves around its field spell, Necrovalley. This card makes it so that cards in the grave, they can't be banished, nor can they be moved out of the grave to any other place. As well, any card that would attempt to change the type or attribute of cards in the graveyard is also getting a fat no. Basically, with this card on the field, the graveyard becomes a tomb itself. And due to this mechanic, a lot of modern decks that rely heavily on the graveyard crumble. Activate Necrovalley. Activate Royal Tribute. Since Necrovalley is on the field, I've activated Royal Tribute. Okay. It's still got to mill. That was kind of a shame. And it's going to mill again. But! But! It didn't fuse! Ironically, the three Ishtar Gravekeepers we see in the original anime, Marik, Ishizu, and Odeon, never actually used a Gravekeeper deck. However, we do see this archetype appear only once in the anime. It was during Yu-Gi-Oh! GX's 27th episode, A Grave Risk, 
where Jaden duels against the Gravekeeper Chief himself, who, believe it or not, actually used a full-fledged Gravekeeper deck. Now, let's take a look at the cards, shall we, that make up the Gravekeeper archetype. To start with, we have three Gravekeeper support monsters, Charm of Shabti, Cat of Ill Omen, and an Owl of Luck. Each one of these monsters represents something in association with Egyptian beliefs. The Charm of Shabti is based on a Ushabti, which was a figurine used during Egyptian funerals. The figurine would be placed in tombs amongst the deceased, so that they could act as the servant for the departed in the afterlife. Cat of Ill Omen is seemingly based on the superstition that seeing a black cat is a harbinger of misfortune. However, ironically, the opposite is true in Egyptian lore. As Egyptians believed, cats were magical creatures capable of bringing luck to those that kept them. Finally, Owl of Luck, well, it's another contradiction. Despite its name implying luck, owls often carry the superstition that if you see them during the day, well, it's considered bad luck. This association carries over into ancient Egypt as well, as in ancient Egypt, owls were often associated with death. It makes sense then that each of these monsters in game offers some form of protection to the wielder. Charm of Shabti, for example, allows the owner during either player's turn to discard it in order to make grave keepers on the field unable to be destroyed by battle that turn. Cat's effect lets the owner choose one trap from their deck and make it the next card they draw while Owl does the same, but for a field spell. And if the archetype's field spell Necrovalley is on the field, then these cards instead go straight to the hand. Now, I'd be amiss if I didn't talk about the most iconic Gravekeeper monsters, the ones that are possibly incarnates of some of the most iconic Yu-Gi-Oh characters. First of all, we have Gravekeeper's Priestess, who is possibly the Gravekeeper incarnation of Ishizu Ishtar. This card's effect is, while there is no face-up field spell, the field is treated as Necro Valley. All Gravekeeper monsters on the field gain 200 attack and defense. With this monster's ability to generate Necro Valley onto the field, albeit only in name, it's only natural that over time, this monster would eventually absorb the actual effect of Necro Valley itself. And so when Gravekeeper's Priestess would grow up, she would become the upgraded level six form Gravekeeper's Shaman. This card gains 200 defense for each Gravekeeper's monster in your grave. Negate all monster effects that activate in the graveyard, except Gravekeeper monsters. While Necro Valley is on the field, your opponent cannot activate field spell cards. Also, field spell cards cannot be destroyed by your opponent's card effects. It's worth noting that these two are incarnates of Ishizu Ishtar. The actual real anime Ishizu does appear in a different card and that is Gravekeeper's Trap. This card and the associated cards with it don't really support Gravekeeper decks too well. However, they do stay with the theme as they have a mastery over the grave and some cards do actually reference the Gravekeeper archetype. So they can work quite well with the Gravekeepers. Next, we have Gravekeeper's Descendant, who is possibly the Gravekeeper incarnation of Marik Ishtar. Its effect is you contribute one of a face-up Gravekeeper monster to target one card your opponent controls, destroy that target. Unfortunately, due to this affinity for destruction, it would eventually lead this monster to the path of usurping his own father, growing up and becoming the level 10 monster, Gravekeeper's Oracle. You can tribute three monsters or one Gravekeeper monster to tribute summon, but not set this card. When this card is tribute summoned, you can activate any of these effects and resolve them in sequence, up to the number of Gravekeeper monsters tributed for its summon. Effect one, this card gains attack equal to combined levels that all monsters tributed for its tribute summon had on the field times 100. Effect 2, destroy all set monsters your opponent controls. Effect 3, all monsters your opponent currently controls lose 2000 attack and defense. Just like in the anime, how Marik was entrusted with the Seal of Memories, so too is Gravekeeper's Oracle, as we see it in the background of this card's artwork, with all three Egyptian gods highlighted in their iconic colors. Not only that, but we can see that Marek usurps his father just like he does in the anime, sitting in the same throne his father once did. We'll talk about that a little bit later. What's more interesting than that, though, is the fact that Oracle, well, it embodies all of the traits of the three Egyptian god cards. What do I mean by this? Well, he's a level 10 monster, so are the Egyptian gods. He can require three tributes for his summon, 
just like the Egyptian gods. Its first effect is a mirror of Ra's sacrifice attack boosting effect. But that's not all. Its second effect is a mirror of Obelisk's board wiping effect. Just, you know, not as good. And its third effect is a mirror of Slifer's second mouth effect that would normally weaken summoned monsters. Where in this case, it just weakens everything on the field. But we're not done. We also have Gravekeeper's Recruiter, who is possibly the Gravekeeper incarnation of Odeon Ishtar. Its effect is, if this card you control is sent to your graveyard, add one Gravekeeper's monster with 1500 or less defense from your deck straight to your hand. Now, Odeon had a very troubled life. No thanks to Mr. Ishtar. Which, speak of the devil, Gravekeeper's Commandant. Possibly the younger Gravekeeper incarnation of Mr. Ishtar. Its effect is you can discard this card to the graveyard to add one Necro Valley from your deck straight to your hand. Ironically, this monster is the odd one out of the entire archetype. Despite being one of the most important Gravekeeper monsters, as it literally searches the best card in the archetype, Necro Valley. It is the only non-dark attributed Gravekeeper. Regardless, this monster would have an older upgraded form the level 8 monster, Gravekeeper's Visionary. You can tribute some of this card by tributing one Gravekeeper's monster. This card gains 200 attack for each Gravekeeper's monster in your graveyard. If this face-up card on the field would be destroyed, you can discard one Gravekeeper's monster instead. We know these monsters are the same because both wear the head of the jackal, embodying the Egyptian god Anubis, who was the protector of graves and guide to the underworld. How fitting. And also, if he wasn't quite on board with allusions to this being Marek's father, well, the white beard present underneath his mask seems to be a bit of a giveaway. And the fact that the Gravekeeper Marek monster usurps the Gravekeeper Mr. Ishtar just seems too on the nose because that's exactly what happened in the anime, thanks to Yami Marek's interventions. It seems there's someone we haven't mentioned yet, and that is Gravekeeper's Spiritualist, who is possibly the younger Gravekeeper incarnation of Mrs. Ishtar. Her effect is, during your main phase, if Necrovalley is on the field, you can fusion summon one spellcaster fusion monster from your extra deck using this card you control and other monsters from your hand or field as fusion material. If we look, Spiritualist and Priestess share many similarities in terms of design, so it would make sense that both were related. You'll notice though that this monster doesn't have an older form like the others. This could be just due to the fact one doesn't exist yet, maybe we'll get one in the future. However, a more sinister reason is because in the anime, Mrs. Ishtar died at a young age when she gave birth to Marek. So perhaps this aspect of the anime is reflected by the lack of an older form to this monster. So that was the Ishtar family. However, we're not done. Gravekeeper's Heretic. Possibly the Gravekeeper incarnation of Thief King Bakura. Its effect is this card on the field is unaffected by all other card effects, as long as Necrovalley is on the field. With the name of this monster, its appearance, and the fact that it is immune to all card effects, even Necrovalley itself, this all alludes very heavily to this monster being Thief King Bakora, the lone survivor of the Kol El Nar massacre. In fact, Heretic would acquire a more powerful fusion form and would serve as currently the only extra deck monster of the entire archetype, Gravekeeper's Supernaturalist. It required two Gravekeeper monsters to be summoned. Its effect is it gains attack and defense equal to the combined original levels of the materials used for its fusion summon times 100. While Necrovalley is on the field, this card and any card in your field zone cannot be destroyed by card effects. During your main phase, you can activate this effect. During the end phase of this turn, add one Gravekeeper monster or one Necrovalley card from your deck straight to your hand. Moving on to the rest of the Gravekeepers, we have Gravekeeper's Assailant. When this card declares an attack while Necrovalley is on the field, you can target one face-up monster your opponent controls, change that target's battle position. We see this monster in the artwork of Royal Tribute, where she is being ritualistically sacrificed in a manner quite similar to the creation of the Millennium Items. After the ritual, she would transform and become the spectral monster Knight Assailant, a monster that would work outside of the Gravekeeper archetype. But with no assassin in the archetype anymore, someone would need to take her place. And that monster to take her place would be Gravekeeper's Ambusher. Its effect was when this card is flipped face up, you can target one card in your opponent's graveyard, 
place that target on the bottom of their deck. If this card is sent from the field to the grave after being flipped face up, you can target one Necrovalley card in your grave, add that target to your hand. These effects are unaffected by Necrovalley. As the Assassin replacement, it's only fitting that this monster's artwork, well, it looks a lot like the Assassin character from Assassin's Creed. Look, you can even see its hidden arm blade. Very on the nose reference right there. We have two flip monsters in the archetype, Gravekeeper's Spy and Gravekeeper's Guard. One lets you bounce an opponent's monster back to the hand. The other lets you special summon a Gravekeeper monster with 1500 or less attack from your deck. We have Gravekeeper's Nobleman, which has the effect that when it is destroyed by a battle by an opponent's attacking monster, you can special summon a Gravekeeper monster from your deck in face down defense. We have Gravekeeper's Headman. If this card is summoned, you can target one level four Gravekeeper monster in the grave, special summon it face up in attack position or in face down defense position. This effect is unaffected by Necrovalley. We have Gravekeeper's Curse, whose effect is if this card is summoned, inflict 500 damage to the opponent. Gravekeeper's Vassal, any battle damage this card inflicts to the opponent is treated as effect damage instead. Gravekeeper's Cannon Holder, who lets you tribute one Gravekeeper monster except itself to inflict 700 damage to the opponent. Gravekeeper's Spear Soldier, which inflicts piercing battle damage. Gravekeeper's Watcher, which during either player's turn when an opponent activates a spell, trap, or monster effect that would make them discard, you can send this card from your hand to the grave to negate that activation, and if you do, destroy it. And we also have Gravekeeper's Chief, who you can only control one of it on the field. This monster makes it so your graveyard is completely unaffected by Necrovalley. And when this card is tribute summoned, you can target one Gravekeeper monster in your grave, special summon it. In terms of the spell and trap lineup for this archetype, well, the Gravekeepers, they have some pretty impressive stuff. The most iconic, of course, is Necrovalley, which is known in the Japanese as Royal Family's Resting Valley, Necrovalley. Its effect is all Gravekeeper monsters gain 500 attack and defense. Cards in the graveyard cannot be banished. Negate any card effect that would move a card in the grave to a different place. Negate any card effect that changes types or attributes in the grave. Fun fact about this card, it has had eight eratums for it its entire life. Its original effect was, as long as this card remains face upon the field, all effects of magic trap and or effect monster cards that involve graveyards are negated, and neither player can remove cards in the graveyard from play. In addition, increase the attack and defense of all monsters that includes gravekeepers in their name by 500. And this card's name is based on the Valley of the Kings from Egypt, which was a place all pharaohs were buried. Like Necro Valley itself, the purpose of this valley was to protect the deceased from being desecrated by grave robbers. And in fact, when Necrovalley is on the field, there are two very powerful cards you can use in conjunction with it. The first is Royal Tribute. This card's effect lets you basically rip every monster card out of both you and your opponent's hand. The other card, Hidden Temples of Necrovalley, well, this card you need to have both the field spell and a Gravekeeper monster on the field to activate. However, if you do activate it, as long as this stays face upon the field, neither player can special summon any form of monster, except Gravekeepers. However, if there are no Gravekeeper monsters or no Necrovalley on the field, then this card destroys itself. We also have the Searcher of the deck, Necrovalley Throne. When you activate it, you can use either one of these effects. Add a Gravekeeper monster from your deck to your hand, or immediately normal summon one Gravekeeper monster. We also have Gravekeeper's Inscription. At the start of your main phase one, apply one of the following effects until the end of your opponent's turn. Neither player can activate card effects in the grave. Neither player can banish cards from the graveyard. Neither player can special summon monsters from the graveyard. We have Gravekeeper's Servant, which forces your opponent to send one card from the top of the deck every time they want to declare an attack as well as Gravekeeper's Steel, which lets you target two Gravekeeper monsters in your grave to add back to your hand. Finally, we have three trap cards for the archetype Imperial Tombs of Necrovalley. When a spell or trap or monster effect is activated, while both a Gravekeeper monster and Necrovalley are on the field, you can negate the activation of that card, and if you do, destroy it. We have Necrovalley Temple. While a Gravekeeper monster and Necrovalley are both on the field, monsters your opponent controls lose 500 attack and defense. Once per turn, during the main phase, if you control no card in your field zone, you can activate one Necrovalley directly from your hand or graveyard. If this card in your possession is destroyed by an opponent's effect and sent to the grave, you can set one Necro Valley straight from your deck. Rite of Spirits. You can target one Gravekeeper in the grave, special summon it. This card's activation and effect are unaffected by Necro Valley. And with that, that is the Gravekeeper archetype done. Do you want to see me play this archetype on Master Duel in a tier zero meta to see how it does? Well, I've left a link pinned in the comments and on your screen right now. Click on either one of those and you can watch it right now. But other than that, thank you for watching. Catch you later.